So I hope everyone got the announcement. It is sitting here for you at the very top, and it tells you what you want to look at for the exam on Tuesday. So recall that this exam is going to cover three chapters. It's been essentially five lecture times together. We spent two lectures and nearly four hours discussing skeletal muscle, right? And at the very end of that, I actually ran out a little bit, a little bit of time, and I said, I want you to read those four or five pages in the salad and book that compared and contrasted smooth muscle with cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. And so on the exam, there will definitely be a Venn diagram, right? And that Venn diagram is going to, right, look something like this. And uh, a little bit cleaner circles. And this will be for skeletal muscle, and this would be for cardiac muscle, and this would be for smooth muscle. And then down here, there would be a number of facts. And so if, if, the, if, the, first, if the first fact was uh, contracts when excited, then it would apply to what? All of them. So uh, the, the, the circle would also have an A here, a B here, a C here. This would be for AC, this would be for BC, this would be for AB, and this would be for A, B, and C, right? All three of them. So if it said contracted when uh, excited, then it would apply to all of them, wouldn't it? So you would bubble on your sheet A, B, and C, okay? And then if it said was voluntary, which of those is voluntary? Skeletal. Only skeletal, so you'd only bubble in A. A. And if it said is involuntary, cardiac and smooth, so you would bubble in B, C. Okay, so that kind of Venn diagram with some facts below it, if you'll read through the last few slides of that chapter 11 and or and or, read to the last, it's like four pages, the very end of chapter 11 in the Saladin textbook. You'll get the facts that you need for that section. The next chapter uh, goes to the um, blood, and that was the pre-recorded lecture. Now, I, I listened back to that last night, and I realized, and maybe some of you noticed, I had 11 or 15 people who listened to it, and there seemed to be a big jump of about six or seven slides. I noticed it. I recorded those six slides this morning, and I merged them in, and they're there. So if you know that you noticed that skip, that is now there in the correct sequence. So if you wanted to go back and listen, there's about 10 minute difference or less, or just depend upon your notes. Those who are listening for the first time now, it's already fixed, okay? So it's just there. But I want to let you know that I'm aware of that little skip. It went from the transferidin story over to blood typing, and it jumped about six or seven slides. So that's been repaired. For the blood cells, you want to make sure that you can recognize the cells, that you know their normal ranges, you know their special characteristics, the things that we talked about in lab. And the one thing we did not talk about in lab that I want you to know, that it tells you on here, is to know the diameter. Right? So I'm telling you to make sure that you also know the size, right? Ah, size and lifespan. So those are two other features that I, I spent time, it's in the notes. Right, so make sure, I don't think I circled the right thing. Um, there it is. Make sure you know the lifespan and that you also know their relative size. Okay, you already know their abundance, you know their normal ranges, and so make sure you also know the relative sizes and their um, um, lifespan. That will be a table that you'll fill in, but there'll be a word bank. So again, you just kind of transfer numbers and data into a, into a into a, a word bank type thing. And then there'll be questions relating to the heart, and that is chapter 19, and that's what we'll be uh, continuing our conversation today about the heart. So, the exam will be at four o'clock on Tuesday, and the exam will be in the blue and gold room as it has been in the past. So definitely look over that. Um, what else? Any other questions about just the exam? There's going to be about 175 questions. It's a lot of questions, a lot of, you know, just quick. It's 100% objective. So there's no short answer on here. So you don't have to worry about any short answer questions. Uh, honestly, in the past, my short answer question would have been compare and contrast skeletal smooth and cardiac muscle. So rather than you're writing it out, I've got the Venn diagram. And another question in the past would have been described to me the lifespan and, and abundance and description of blood cells. And instead of your writing a short answer, I've created a table that you fill in off a of word bank. So it's, it's all the same material, right? 
So 175 questions, it seems long, uh, but it really goes really fast, and you'll have all two hours to complete the exam. So this is the same exam that they normally take in an hour and a half during the winter and fall semester, so you won't have a problem, I'm sure of it. And then when we get to the heart, you want to make sure you know what we did in lab, the EKGs, uh, the parts of the EKG and, and what we focused on in lab, and then also what I'm going to add into our conversation about that today. So before I go further and jump over to where we were, and I'm going to pick up on a, on a review, what questions do you have right now about the exam and how to assure you've got the right material? What are you thinking about? Anything? I'm just wondering, um, what is it from the EKG do we have to know? Make sure you know, make sure, yeah, make sure you know the, the waves, right, the P wave, then the QRS complex, and then the T wave, and make sure you know what, what each deflection, what each wave represents when it comes to the cardiac conduction system. So you know that the P wave is, the, is caused by the depolarization of the SA node and the uh, atrial cells. And you know that the QRS is caused by the depolarization of the AV node and the uh, depolarization of the ventricles, and that the T wave represents the repolarization of the ventricle, that kind of thing. Do we need to know the distances, like the dots and the um, There's a couple of questions, but they're very, very basic ones um, relating to what a normal EKG looks like. Um, so I would... I, I would review what I've discussed here, right, in lecture, and um, I think reviewing what we've done here and what you've seen in lab, you'll be in good shape. Um, there's a couple of questions on the exam that are going to make you think. That's fair. Uh, but overall, I think you'll find it very straightforward. Don't forget, too, when we're talking about muscle, you want to go back and know that story about muscle contraction, right, the actin, the calcium, the myosin, and, you know, the whole power stroke deal. Make sure you know that story well um, as well. Any other questions about how to, how to focus or what to focus on? Fair amount of material, but I think it's more comfortable. I think we have a really good foundation on this material, so I think what we're building on is, is uh, certainly more uh, certain than the, his, than the uh, endocrine system, right? We didn't like the endocrine system. So I, I'm, I'm looking for great things uh, now that the endocrine system has gone by us. I'm moving down to about slide 84, and this is the beginning with the phases of the cardiac cycle. We weren't completely through this, so I want to go ahead and just start again here and ramp us back into this conversation. And if I'm looking at an EKG, what's the easiest way of defining a cardiac cycle? From what to what? R to R, right? I could go P to P, S to S, T to T. But the R wave is so substantial and so significant that it's much easier just to grab from the R peak to the next R peak. And remind me, what should that distance be? I should say distance, time. How much time should have passed in the average R to R interval? 0.8 seconds with a range acceptable between 0.6 and 1.2 seconds which would represent a heart rate of what? Anywhere between 50 and 100 would be considered normal. Below 50, we would refer to it as bradycardia. Above 100, we would refer to it as tachycardia. Good. Um, so let's think. So you've, you've got the EKG, right? You can picture the EKG. You know what the EKG means as far as the conduction system. What is it that's firing? What, you know, the SA node and the AV node, the bundle fibers and the Purkinje fibers. Now we have to figure out what's actually happening in the heart as a reflection of what we already know. So we're going to talk about the phases of the cardiac cycle, and now we're dealing with the movement of blood. And the ventricles are the focus here because that is the more muscular of the chamber. So we're going to be focusing on what's happening with the blood flow into the ventricles. And we also have to remind ourselves of the valves that are allowing the blood to come into the ventricles and the valves that are going to be opened as blood leaves the ventricles. So we're going to describe the phases of the, the cardiac cycle as being 
one, ventricular filling. Picture it, right? Just what is it saying? The ventricles are filling with blood. So what must be open? The AV valves must be open, right? The atria are squeezing or somehow releasing blood down to the ventricles. Part of it's gravity. Part of it is the contraction of the atria. Number two, isovolumetric contraction. Contraction, squeezing, but without a change in what? Volume, volume right? Isovolumetric, same volume. So that means that the, the ventricles are beginning to squeeze, but there has not yet been a volume change. Number three, ventricular ejection. Fancy word of saying, I'm now squeezing hard enough that blood is now being ejected, leaving the ventricle. Through what valve? Bzz. The semilunar valves, right? Either the aortic or the pulmonary valve. And then there's going to be a time of isovolumetric relaxation. Okay, so I just squeezed, I just ejected blood. I don't get all of it out, right? I only squeeze a portion of the blood out. The blood that's left behind, isovolumetric relaxation. So the heart's relaxing, the volume's not changing because more blood has not yet come in. Right, so this is a complete cycle. Let the names just name themselves, just get a visual of this. I don't want you memorizing phrases. I want you to have a mental you know, picture of what's going on at each of these stages. And again, this whole movement of blood is happening at you know, uh, the cardiac cycle in less than typically one second. So let's go through this. I think we've got it. We went through this last time. Let me just give us this whole story again. So during ventricular filling, right, um, the ventricles during filling are in what phase? The ventricles are filling during, during their time of relaxation, during their time of diastole. And so the ventricles are expanding. Blood is coming down from the atria because the AV valves open and blood is now draining down to the ventricles. It happens in three phases, the rapid, then the diastasis, and then the, the systole. So basically the, the valve opens, if you will, and blood comes down, Whoop, big, big blob of blood. It's just gravity, fast ventricular filling. And then there's a slower filling time called diastasis. And then there's the squeezing, right? Di atrial systole, and that's going to basically squeeze some more blood as, um, as the atria go through that cycle. This term EDV, the end diastolic volume, the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of their relaxation time. So this is the maximum amount of blood that's sitting in the ventricle before it squeezes. On average, 130 mils. Okay, this is an average number. Again, typically these average numbers represent that. Who knows who that 25-year-old, you know, 150-pound male is, but these are those average numbers. Then there's going to be isovolumetric contraction. That is the atria. They're done squeezing, right? They're done. They're repolarizing. The ventricles are about to begin to squeeze, and as they begin to squeeze, there's a contraction, but it's not enough to push open the semilunar valves, so the volume's not changing yet. Isovolumetric contraction. The ventricles begin to depolarize. That QRS complex is, is happening on the EKG, and the AV valves are going to close. Why must those AV valves close? Yeah, if my AV valves are not closed, then as the ventricles begin to contract, blood would go poof, right back up to the atria, right? And we don't want that. We want a unidirectional movement. And so as the ventricles contract, blood is being pushed now toward the semilunar valves. What is it that's anchoring those AV valves down so tightly? The papillary muscles attached to the chordae tendineae. And what, what else is causing those papillary muscles to contract? those Purkinje fibers. Purkinje. So from the AV valve down the bundle branches around the Purkinje fibers, those Purkinje fibers also go along the papillary muscles. So that means that as the ventricles are contracting, what's happening? The papillary muscles are also contracting. They're yanking down those cords and keeping that valve tightly closed. So as they begin to squeeze, the AV valves are gonna close. It's still isovolumetric because we haven't left, we haven't let any blood leave yet.
And as those AV valves close, we're going to hear lub, right? S1, the first sound. See what I'm doing? I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm taking all this and trying to make it into one cohesive story. It's a lot of stuff. It really is. But it's not an unreasonable story. It's just a lot of players, a lot of things going on. Um, at this point, all four valves are actually closed, right? The AV valve is just closed, whoop, and the, and the semilunar valves have not yet been pushed open. So there's a time at which all four valves are closed. All four valves are sitting in a connective tissue layer referred to as the... All four valves are sitting anatomically in a layer of the heart surrounded by connective tissue, and that is called the fibrous skeleton. And that fibrous skeleton is both structural, keeping things in their proper place, but it also acts partially as an insulation so that cells that are being excited by the atria, the ventricular cells cannot be directly excited, right? There has to be a gap between the atria and the ventricles. So now we're into ventricular ejection. That is, the, the pressure of the ventricles is going to get to the point where it's going to exceed the pressure of the valve, and we're going to push open those semilunar valves. Blood's going to spurt out, poop, right? And very, very fast at first, and then more slowly. Surprise, surprise, right? So faster, and then a little bit slower. And um, this ejection is going to last for about 200 to 250 milliseconds. That time of sustained contraction corresponds with what? That plateau that we saw on the depolarization action potential of cardiac muscle. You don't want our heart muscle to twitch. We don't want our heart muscle to act like a skeletal muscle. Right? Skeletal muscle, when, it's when, it, when it is uh, activated, does a little twitch. We don't want our heart twitching. Right? We don't want our heart twitching. We want our heart to squeeze and sustain that squeeze. So it's a little bit different physiology that assures that the heart works properly. Then. Right? We've got ventricular ejection because the, the ventricles are still squeezing, and then the T wave will start. Well, the T wave is the beginning of the repolarization of the ventricles. They're going to begin to relax. In the time that we were squeezing, how much blood did we push out? It's what's called the stroke volume. So every time the heart squeezes, there's a certain amount of blood that's going to be squeezing, squeezed out, right? And that's going to be the stroke volume. The stroke volume, on average, 70 mils. How much did you start with? 130, average. 70 were spit out. What's left behind? 60. That 60 is called the end systolic volume, the volume at the end of the contraction, right? ESV. That's 60. What percentage of blood was ejected is called the ejection fraction. So what fraction got emitted? 70 out of 130. The math, average of 54%. So a little bit more than half of your blood is going to be squeezed out each and every time. You're not going to squeeze it out completely, right? A little over half is going to be squeezed out each and every time, and that ejection fraction can rise really, really high. Because during exercise, right, sympathetic activation, uh, your heart is beating not only faster but also stronger. So if your heart's beating stronger, it could squeeze harder and eject even more blood each and every time. So that would drive the stroke volume higher. But at rest, about 54%. Then, okay, so we, 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 we've stroked out. We've stroked out. That's not the right word, right? We, we've pushed the blood out, right? And, uh, and we've got two places for stroke in this test, don't we? All right, we've got the power stroke of the myosin actin, and then we have this stroke relating to each beat of the heart and how much blood is pushed out. Then we're going to be relaxing the ventricles, so we're going to go into a relaxation, a ventricular diastole, and this is described as being isovolumetric, again, because the, the ventricles are relaxing. That blood that was sitting there, that 60 mils is still sitting there, right? And no more blood has been added, so it's isovolumetric, same volume. And around and around and around we go. All right, just keep on going around and around. Does that all make good sense? When, those, when we went into the relaxation phase and the semilunar valves closed, that would represent the second sound, S2, 
the dub. What do you think? Now, let's take those events, and I hope, again, you're not just memorizing, oh, isovolumetric this. No, just, 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 you know, walk yourself through it and make common sense out of it, please. Now, let's think about this cardiac cycle in relationship to the timing that we know is happening on the EKG. So, atrial systole, about 0.1 seconds. Okay, so the atria are going to squeeze for about 0.1 seconds. Hmm, what does that represent on the EKG? When are the atria contracting? The P wave, right? What's the P wave? The P wave is the firing of the SA node and the initiation of the depolarization. And shortly thereafter, right, as soon as the signal is sent, then the atria will begin to contract. And they're going to stay, right, contracted for about 0.1 seconds. What's the normal P to R interval? 0.12 to 0.20. Does the entire P to R interval represent when the atria is contracting? Not the entire thing. Right? If you go back and look, you'll see that there's a little bit of a delay. So about a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds for atrial systole. Then we get down to ventricular systole, lasting about 0.3 seconds. That's 300 milliseconds. That's really, really similar to that 200 to 250 milliseconds, isn't it? Remember, the, ventricle, the ventricular cells are essentially contracting simultaneously. I mean, is it exactly simultaneously? Remember I told you it rings out like a mop, right? So it's starting at the apex and then rings and contracts in an upward motion. So each cell has that plateau of like 200 to 250 milliseconds, but collectively the whole ventricle is squeezing for about 0.3 seconds. Okay. And then there's a period, the quiescent period, when all four chambers are relaxed at 0.4. So what we can see is that out of the 0.8 seconds, half of the time your heart is completely at rest, right? Half of the 0.8. The other 0.1 and 0.3, it's quite busy uh, doing its thing. So here is a beautiful graph. I know it's small. This is 19-20 in your textbook. And what this does is it puts it all on one graph. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. This image appears on the exam. So don't have to memorize it. I don't remember where. I just remember somewhere on the exam, this image is there. And there's going to be a question about it, but the most important thing is the image is there. right? So you, I, I'm telling you now, it's, it's on the exam. And what this is going to do is basically pull all of this together. Now. This box through here is the EKG. That's what we know the best, OK? That's the EKG. And so let's think about this. What's going on at the P wave? The beginning of the atrial depolarization, right? And then what's going to happen here at the QRS? This is the beginning of the Ventricular. What did I tell you happens right before the ventricles start to squeeze? What closes? Right before the ventricles squeeze, the AV valves better close. So, oh, look, there's S1. Okay, right? So, S1, right? Right as the ventricles squeeze, we see S1 right there, isn't it? Right about that same time as the ventricles begin to squeeze. And then the repolarization of the ventricles, right? The end of that, what would happen when the ventricles relax? The semilunar valves would close, and we would hear S2. OK, so the, the sounds are lined up now with our EKG. Do you see that? Let's start there. Yes? Is that making sense? What about EDV? End diastolic volume. When would the end diastolic volume be max? Right 
at that point, right, we see the graph's on the highest, right? It's the max. So the EDV would be the highest where? Right before the ventricles squeeze, right? So does it make sense that the EDV, right, is right about where the QRS complex is? The, the ventricles are about to contract, so that's the time when the blood would be the maximum in the ventricles at the end of their relaxation phase. And then where would the volume be the lowest in the ventricles? The ESV would be after all the squeezing had happened, right? And, and we're waiting, sitting there, waiting for the next cycle to begin. So does, do the sounds make sense in relationship to the EKG? And does the EDV, the end diastolic, and the ESV, the end systolic volume, also make sense in light of what you know about an EKG and the actions of the heart? It takes a moment to stare at it and get it to all come together. But like I said, this image is on the exam. So it'll be there. So if you, can, if you can understand what I'm saying, you don't have to recreate this in your head. You'll have it to look at. That's a huge help. Now, what's going on at the very top? Um, now, up here it says diastole and systole. Which diastole and which systole? If you only see one mentioned, that systole is referring only to the ventricular systole, right? Because that's the, the more significant time of contraction. So when is the heart squeezing? Right? Systole is happening where? Right? What's happening down here on the EKG? Right? The systole, that orange bar, is when? Between the QRS and the end of the T, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And when is the heart in, when, is, when are the ventricles in diastole? Well, after the T has relaxed and before the QRS again. I know it's a lot of black scribbles up there, right? But is it beginning? Do you see how we're, we're pulling all these things into one cohesive report? This figure is like the key. Mm -hmm. So any questions I ask about the timing of something, eh, go back and look at the figure. Yeah. What else? Ah. There's a couple more things on here. When would the aortic valve open? Based on the EKG, when would the, a, when would the aortic valve open? Right after the AV valve's closed, and that would be happening when? When the ventricles are in it's contraction, right? So it's, it's in the right place. They got it right. And when would the aortic valve close? Right, the aortic valve is going to close as the heart right, is finishing up the repolarization, the relaxation of the ventricles. Isn't it a beautiful figure? It's just all there for you. Okay. Any questions about that image? It's worth staring at. It, it's, worth, it's worth going to your textbook and, and going to chapter 19 and grabbing uh, figure 20 and staring at that image. It really is. It'll pull a lot of things together for you. So let's put these numbers on a table here. So again, what was ESV? End systolic volume. Give me what that means in common. Give me, give me another way of saying that. Right, the end, end systolic. At the end of the squeeze, what's the volume of blood? Average, 60. Now, I'm going to refill. Right, so that means that when the, uh, when the AV valve opens and the ventricles are going to refill, how much blood is going to come in? 70, right? And so that's going to give us a total EDV of 130. And then we're going to squeeze. And the volume that is squeezed out is going to be the stroke volume. So we lose 70 and we're back to 60. Right, it's just an accounting page. So we start with 60, add 70 lose 70, right? So they're just constantly pushing this blood forward. Now, this is key on the bottom. In a normal heart, both ventricles must be ejecting the same volume of blood. Now, I know that at first, it's, it's not a trick question, but you've got to think about it. 
at first you might think, oh, the left ventricle must squeeze more blood out because we know the left ventricle is more muscular. But if the left side of the heart was squeezing a greater amount of blood than the right side, and our circulatory system is a closed system, I mean, there's no, there's no bypass valve, right? So we'd be in trouble really, really fast if the two sides of the heart weren't pumping equal amounts. We're going to see, though, what happens. Not on this exam, I don't think. I think it's going to be in the Chapter 20 material that will be on the next exam. And we'll talk about what happens when one side of the heart is weaker than the other. And where does that extra fluid go? So we'll talk about that. I don't think it's on this test. Eh, we'll see in the next hour. Oh, it's right there. Take that back. Let's talk about that right now, shall we? Okay. So... Um, you got two hearts, right? Left and right. You'll hear people talk about the left heart and the right heart. The right heart is doing what? Squeezing blood and going where? Yeah. To the lungs. Pretty short distance. Not a lot of pressure. Left heart is pumping blood systemically, right, to my brain and my big toe. It needs a little more pressure. What happens if the left ventricle is pumping less blood? The left is pumping less. So, where, so if the left is pumping less and the right is pumping more, say it either way you want to. So, where's, so who's getting more blood than it should be getting? If the right is doing more than the left, then the lungs are getting overwhelmed by blood volume. So what would be the symptom of a person with a weak left or a you know, stronger right heart? Edema, swelling in the lungs, right? Fluid is, is going to the lungs and is going to cause edema. Now, what's wrong with that? Who wants to drown, right? I mean, basically, pulmonary edema means that there's so much fluid buildup in your lungs, what can't happen? Gas exchange, right? And we'll come back to that in, in gory detail in the respiratory system. But if there's fluid building up in your alveoli and around your alveoli, then you're not going to be able to exchange gases properly. Does that make sense? Does everyone get that? Okay, if the left side is pumping less, aka the right side is pumping more, then more blood will be going to the lungs than it should be, which would lead to a buildup of fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema. Flip it. What if instead your right ventricle was pumping less or your left ventricle was pumping more, then you'd have more blood going where? To your systemic circulation. And by gravity, that extra fluid would show up in your ankles. Okay? So a person with puffy ankles uh, can be a sign of heart problems. Not always. There's lots of other reasons why someone might have puffy ankles. But... Chronic puffy ankles, right, can be a sign, a concern about the overall heart. A couple of years ago, my daughter was, you know, going to the doctor, and, and, and uh, she looked down her ankles. She said, your ankles are kind of puffy. And she said, well, yeah, they are sometimes. And the doctor sent her right out to the emergency room, maybe a little bit over, over uh, zealous, but wanting her to go get checked out. She was concerned, right, that she was having some puffy ankles, and who knows what it could be. So just to check off all the boxes, had her go do an EKG and make sure everything was okay, and everything was okay. But uh, the doctor was, you know, really, really concerned, a young person, all of a sudden, kind of an onset of swollen ankles, what might it be? So we checked off all the boxes. Thankful, thankful for insurance, right? Uh, so does that make sense? Systemic edema and gravity is going to pull most of that systemic fluid to the ankles just because of gravity, and we'll discuss some of that also in Chapter 20. So if either ventricle is not ejecting blood well, then this, is, this can lead to congestive heart failure. Now, CHF um, usually is the result of someone already having had a heart attack. So they've had a heart attack. There's been a weakening of the heart muscle. The heart is no longer pumping equally, right? It's not doing its job. The left and right side are not as well balanced. Uh, this also could be from chronic hypertension. It could be from a valve problem, right, valvular insufficiency, or maybe you were just born with a, a heart defect, some congenital issue. 
But regardless, the heart is weakened by some reason. And this can lead to a buildup again of fluid. I've already said this. So if the left ventricular, if the left ventricle is the failing side, and again, turn it around if it helps you. If the left is, is failing, then the right is over pumping, right? So that's going to push all that blood to the lungs and cause some pulmonary edema. If the right side is failing, that means the left side is overdoing it, and that's going to lead to systemic edema. That could also lead not only to the ankles and the feet, but it could be to the fingers, you know, any, any extreme end. And it could even, in the worst case, uh, cause distension of the jugular veins, right? So blood coming back from the heart through the jugular veins, you'll see um, in a person with CHF um, some, uh, you know, larger uh, veins in the neck and even uh, pooling of fluid in the abdominal cavity. And eventually, right, the heart can't deal with this and CHF um, can lead to a total heart failure. What do we think? Is that conversation making sense? So you're connecting everything we've done so far into one pretty picture. How much blood are you pumping out each time your heart beats? Volume, 70 mils. And that volume is called the stroke volume, the SV. Another term that I want to introduce to you is cardiac output. Now, cardiac output, CO, is the amount of blood ejected by a ventricle in one minute. So how would I calculate this? Right, so that means that cardiac output is what? The number of beats per minute times the amount of blood ejected each time. For an average person at rest, cardiac output's before, between four and six liters per minute. How much blood does a person have? Between four and six liters. So one way of thinking about this is that basically your entire blood circulation is going to make it around every minute, right? Pretty phenomenal when you think about that just in a general sense, right? So your four to six liters of blood is going to get circulated in one minute. So if you were a little red blood cell and you were traveling on the magic school bus ride, right, and you left the aorta and you made a cycle of the average cycle around the body, you'd be back to the right atrium in a minute. Fun to think about. Now, during exercise, your heart's beating faster and harder, and your cardiac output can go way up um, to 21 or even into the mid 30s uh, for liters of blood per minute. So, you know, monstrously different, four to six at rest, but our heart can definitely, what we'll talk about today is the heart can definitely take on a lot more work than it is doing at rest. It really can do a phenomenal amount of work. So cardiac reserve is the difference between a person's maximum and their resting uh, cardiac output. So a person who's very, very fit would have a what? A very large cardiac reserve. In other words, let's say their resting's at five and they can get it up to 30, right, during extreme exercise. So their cardiac reserve is 25, right, the difference. A person who's not as fit their resting is also five, but they can only get that cardiac output up to 10 or 15, right? So their cardiac reserve would be less. So the cardiac reserve is, is a sign or a, 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 an indication of overall fitness. As we get older, the cardiac output will stay relatively constant. Seems interesting, doesn't it? So in other words, your brain still needs as much oxygen. It still needs as much blood per minute as it did when you were five as it does when you're 55. But the heart rate, as we get older, does what? Heart rate goes up. So if the heart rate is going to go up as we age and the stroke and the cardiac output stays relatively constant, what must be going down as we age? Stroke volume. In other words, our heart becomes less efficient, right? 
So if our heart's beating and every time it beats, it squirts out 70 mils, right? And as we and, and we need to keep our cardiac output the same throughout our life. And as we get older, our heart rate will go up in part because our ejection fraction or our, our stroke volume will go down. Does that make sense? The relationship, right? So the equation is, go back to the equation, the equation you need to remember is this one. Right? Cardiac output equals CO equals HR, heart rate, times SV, stroke volume. It'll be too late to appreciate it, but next week in lab, we'll play with this equation a lot. Okay? And you'll learn more about it. But for now, know that relationship between heart rate and stroke volume. In the lab this week, each table uh, hooked up a person to do an EKG. And the EKGs worked pretty well for everybody. The thing we were having trouble with this week were the, was the pulsometer, wasn't it? Right? It, it wasn't, uh, I didn't get many groups that were getting a nice reading on that, and that's just something we got to work out in the lab. But what would your pulse be in relationship to your, to your EKG? Every cardiac cycle, right? Every time heart, the blood's being pushed out, you should sense that as a pulse, right? So when you measure your pulse, what do you do? Put your finger on your radial pulse or wherever, put on your carotid, and what are you feeling? The expansion, right, of your arteries. And the arteries are expanding in response to the pumping. So your heart rate equals your pulse, right? There's, there's not a discrepancy there. So if, you're, uh, if your heart's beating 120 times a minute, so too your pulse would be 120. Just really easy to measure, isn't it? So we can, go to our, we can go to our carotid in our neck. We can go to our radial pulse in our wrist. Average, young male, 74 to, uh, 64 to 72. Don't worry about the numbers. Um, females, a little bit higher. And again, heart rate rises in the elderly. So what did I say the average was? In lab, I said the average heart rate was 75. So, you know, younger people, right? 64, 72, 72, 80, right? And take the whole population, and we're saying about 75 average. If you went to the nursing home, though, and took a check, eh, it would be an average of 75, right? It'd be a little higher. We know these terms, yay. Tachycardia, we're going to say is anything over 100. Therefore, what's going on? Tachycardia. What's the, what's the R to R? Shorter, right? Yeah. It's a higher heart rate, therefore the heart is beating more often with less time in between. So a shorter R to R. Less than what? The R range normal was what? 0.6 to 1.2. So that means for someone to have tachycardia, their heart, their R to R interval would be less than 0.6, right? It's beating really, really fast. What can cause it? Stress. You all feeling a little tachycardic right now? Will you be a little more tachycardic when you come to the exam next Tuesday? Yeah. Right, a little more stressed, right? It's, it's okay. Um, hopefully not for any other reason. Um, or it could be from a, la a lack of or loss of blood. Why would that? Why would you become tachycardic? You're bleeding out, right? Monday night, you said, ah, forget it. Just, no. So right, you're bleeding out, right? <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> you're watching some show, right? Bang, bang. OK, they're bleeding out. What's your heart? I know, it's horrible. What's your heart going to do in response to that? The, the heart is saying what? Blood's leaving. My heart, my, my, my brain's not happy right now. I'm not getting enough blood. So your heart's going to do what in response? Increases heart rate, right? Okay, we get it. So you're losing blood, your heart rate's going to go up. Okay, got it. For whatever reason. Okay. Now, bradycardia. Bradycardia, what's that? Really slow. We said normal was between 0.6 R to R and 1.2. We said that anything less than 
50 beats per minute was bradycardic. So that means that their heart is beating what? Less frequently than every 1.2 seconds. And what's going to cause this? Sleep, I hope, right? All right, a little sleep, um, lower body temperature. And, and if you're a well-trained athlete, your resting heart rate will be lower uh, than the average person. So we, we've got a student here, and she told me that her, her rate's usually in the, you know, high 40s at rest, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you're a cross-country runner and you've got one of those, you know, crazy uh, way efficient hearts, but why can their heart beat so slowly? Why can their heart beat so slowly? Because their heart is so well conditioned that it's extremely efficient, right? So each stroke of the heart is so efficient that it doesn't have to beat as often. But their cardiac output is back to normal. Right, so the cardiac output is between is that normal number, so each beat is not it's not very often, right? So what's our equation? Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So if the heart rate's really really low. That means that their stroke volume must be higher, right, to compensate. Okay, but their brain still needs as much oxygen. Now, this term chronotropic. Look at that word for me. Chronotropic. I don't want you memorizing this. Chrono. Uh oh, time, right? Chronic condition lasts a long time. Chronos, time. Tropic, influencing. Okay, so a positive chronotropic agent would be one that does what? Causes a increase in the speed or timing of the heart. Influences, right? Influence the timing in a positive way. So anything that's a positive chronotropic agent is going to increase your heart rate. Things like? Caffeine, right? That would be a positive chronotropic agent. A negative chronotropic agent would be one that would lower your heart rate. Do you see the term? Again, we know our vocab. Tropic meaning to influence, chrono meaning time. Positive to increase the heart rate, negative to decrease the heart rate. What else can increase your heart rate? When bear walks in the room, right? So when bear walks in the room, we've got our sympathetic nervous system going to going to bat for us. So clearly, the sympathetic nervous system would be a would be able to have a positive chronotropic effect. The parasympathetic, we would think, would have a negative chronotropic effect on the heart. Yes, those, all those words making sense in a sentence. You know that the heart is autorhythmic. You know, therefore, that the heart is not requiring the central nervous system to initiate its heartbeat. It is instead set by the pacemaker. But the pacemaker is connected to the autonomic nervous system. Remember that there's a cardiac plexus, a group of nerves that do travel to the heart, and those nerves are going to be partially sympathetic, and some of them will be parasympathetic fibers. The part of the heart, let me back up. We know that the autonomic nervous system is involuntary. Therefore, it would not be initiated anywhere up in the cerebrum, correct? All autonomic things are instead initiated or regulated somewhere in the brain stem. Specifically, in the medulla oblongata is what's called the cardiac centers. So the cardiac center, the part of the brain that is regulating your heartbeat is certainly not your consciousness. It's down in your brain stem, specifically in the medulla oblongata. And it's there that you are sending signals to your SA node. What nerve was sending signals to the SA node and the AV node? I mentioned the vagus nerve, number 10, right? Parasympathetic. Remember we talked about the vagal tone, that the heart would want to naturally beat faster than it does? But because it's in constant communication with the parasympathetic nervous system, it slows it down, not initiating it, but influencing it. So the vagus nerve is definitely traveling, influenced from the medulla oblongata. And um, again, some signals going to the heart would be sympathetic pathways, so you would be able to increase the heart rate. Other 
nerve signals going to the heart through the vagus nerve would be parasympathetic. Okay, what in the world, or let's pull, let's pull this all together, and actually we're pulling together not only the heart, but also muscle as we do this. Sympathetic and parasympathetic system, remember they work by a two neuron system, remember this? There's a pre and a post. We're dealing with the sympathetic nervous system, so remind me, where does the sympathetic nervous system initiate? Comes off the spinal cord where? Thoracolumbar. And we're dealing here with a sympathetic postganglionic fiber. And I'm telling you that the sympathetic postganglionic fibers are adrenergic. What does that mean? That these neurons release adrenergic. They release adrenaline. And we know that, right? Sympathetic nervous system, we think adrenaline. So these nervous, these nerves, right? These sympathetic nerves are traveling. They're going to the heart, and they're going to release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. And that norepinephrine is going to bind to beta adrenergic fibers. Have you heard of beta blockers and alpha blockers? Okay. So medications, why does someone get a beta blocker? To help reduce their blood pressure and heart rate. It's exactly where it's working, right? So the sympathetic nervous system has the ability of doing what? Releasing norepinephrine, which binds to beta receptors and causes an increase in calcium. And an increase in calcium leads to, as we would expect, what? A greater depolarization. So if we give someone a beta blocker, what are we doing? We're interrupting this signal. We're not allowing the heart to beat faster. Right? We're blocking this thing. Now, the, the way it's working at the molecular level is that the beta adrenergic fibers are activating one of those secondary messenger systems that we haven't described, sort of that big hocus-pocus box. But ultimately, what it does is it leads to an increase in sodium, or sorry, calcium channels. Well, you tell me. Remember, this is cardiac muscle. And remember... What was different about cardiac muscle? The upward depolarizing swing was not just sodium, but also calcium. So if I'm opening up more calcium channels, I'm going to allow the heart to do what? Accelerate its depolarization. Okay? So that means not only am I going to increase, now listen, not only am I going to increase my depolarization, but this same mechanism accelerates the, the faster reuptake of calcium. Okay, so that means that the heart will beat faster, but also relax more quickly. This would allow for what? If it can, re if it can, go, if it can depolarize more quickly and simultaneously relax more quickly, that would cause or allow the heart rate to go Right, because normally, remember I told you the calcium usually is sequestered very slowly, and what did that do to the cardiac muscle? Kept it in that plateau, didn't it? Because the calcium was not sequestered as quickly. So if the beta adrenergic response, if the sympathetic surge causes the calcium to be retaken up, sequestered more quickly, then we can speed up the rate of the heart. So with the bear chasing you, 230, right? Now, of course, that won't be, it depends on your age. But in a younger person, you can get your heart rate up way over 200 if you're really, really scared or, or running really hard. But here's what happens. What if this, anyone ever taken an EpiPen, okay, meaningly, or knows what happens when someone takes an EpiPen, right? They're having an allergic response. We, we stick some epinephrine or some norepinephrine in their thigh. What are their symptoms? Heart rate goes up. Respiration goes up. Right, airways open, which is what we're worried about. The airways closing down in an allergic response. But those people will say, man, my heart's beating faster, but it feels like it's beating out of my chest. Because not only is the heart beating faster, but it's beating harder, stronger. The problem is, if your heart's beating really, really fast, what can't happen? Can't rest. Can't rest, and therefore, if it can't rest, it can't refill. refill. 
okay, we're back to the whole problem, right? We need to have the heart rate at a rate such that there's enough time for the blood to actually move from the atria down to the ventricles to allow for adequate pumping of blood. And if the heart's beating too fast, right, I can't fill my hand up with blood, right? It's moving too fast. So if the heart rate's too high, what starts to happen? Both the stroke volume and the cardiac output are reduced. And my brain says, wait a second, guy, I need, I need blood to my brain. And it's not getting it, is it? Okay, so yes, during exercise and when you're scared, raising your heart rate is okay for a short while, but to keep it up there too long, whoa, not good, right? Because your heart's not having adequate time to refill. Your overall cardiac output goes down, as does your stroke volume, right? Because if there isn't enough time to fill it, that means that there won't be as much blood there to eject. So your stroke volume would go down and your overall cardiac output would go down. Now, if that's the effect of norepinephrine, how come then your body would do that for a better play? Is that for short term, hopefully. Short right? Term. Hopefully short term, right? Hopefully the you know, you get away before the bear gets you. I mean if it's a shot, it's more system. Again, I mean if you're if you're getting a shot of epinephrine, you're doing it because you're fearful of an allergic response. It's directly into the bloodstream, right? I mean, it's directly into the bloodstream, and the whole idea of an EpiPen is just to keep the airways open until help can get there, right? You don't want that tongue to swell up and the airway to close down. Other, other question? Okay. So that's positive chronotropic, isn't it? Increasing the heart rate. What about parasympathetic? We've already mentioned this. We know that it's the vagus nerve that is part of this response. And the vagus nerve, remember I told you, that the right side goes to one node and the left side goes to another node. So remember, you got a left and a right vagus nerve, and one is specifically coming down and talking with the SA node, the other is coming down and specifically inhibiting the AV node. In the parasympathetic nervous system, what is the only neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine, right? You may remember this. The sympathetic had a norepinephrine, the parasympathetic always had acetylcholine. And acetylcholine then binds to a kind of receptor called the muscarinic receptor. Now what muscarinic receptors are going to do are open potassium gates. Hmm. If you open potassium gates, what's going to happen to the resting membrane potential? Where is, where is potassium usually in higher concentration? <clears throat> Inside the cell. So if I'm going to open potassium gates, potassium is going to flow out. I'm losing a positive charge, therefore the inside becomes more negative. That is, the inside of the cell becomes more hyperpolarized. If a cell is hyperpolarized, it's going to have a more difficult time reaching threshold and therefore would fire less often. Yes? So we know the parasympathetic causes the heart to slow down. How? Specifically, the acetylcholine binds to a muscarinic receptor. The muscarinic receptor causes potassium channels to open, leading to a greater hyperpolarization and less opportunity for depolarization or for um, threshold. Okay. Now, there's a little fact here. It says down here, parasympathetics do not need a second messenger system. Now, I know we didn't talk about the details of a second messenger system, but I, I always call it the black box, right? So something happens, something binds, and then hocus pocus happens, and then something occurs inside the cell. Well, because there isn't a second messenger system, it happens faster, right? So parasympathetic system, or parasympathetics actually work on the heart faster than sympathetics, which kind of seems backwards, right? Because we've always told ourselves sympathetic things are fast and parasympathetic things are slow. But when it comes to the heart, it turns out that the parasympathetic system, the, par the, the vagus nerve, actually can work faster than the sympathetics. I've already mentioned this as well, but it now pulls it all together. Your heart would want to beat about every 100 times a minute, 100 beats per minute. That would be, quote, its intrinsic firing rate. Take away the vagus nerve, right? Take away the central nervous system. Take away the influence of the parasympathetic system and the heart would want to beat closer to 100. But because of the constant connection to the vagus 
our heart only goes at 70 to 80, right? With 75, again, being the average. If you were to have damage to your vagus nerve, talk to me. What would you see? Your patient would have a higher heart rate, right? They'd have a higher intrinsic heart rate. So if there was any kind of damage to the vagus nerve, does that make sense? If you damage the vagus nerve, then it would decrease the parasympathetic influence and therefore increase the heart rate. What else can influence your heart rate? I'm telling you right now that there's a rheostat going on, right? Re uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic can certainly influence it. But what else can cause your heart rate to go up? Medications, Medications yes. But let's think about things that maybe we have in the higher brain centers. I'm going to go see a scary movie. Uh -oh. <laughs> my limbic system, my emotional centers, my amygdala is lit up. Does our heart rate go up? Yeah. Absolutely, right? So what I'm saying to you is that there's ways to influence your heart rate in higher brain areas than your brain stem, limbic system being one of them. Your hypothalamus can influence it. And can you think of something scary? Can you conjure up a memory from your cerebral cortex, right? A, a, a recollection or something? Yeah. So clearly, even our you know, higher brain areas can influence our heart rate through emotional and sensory stimuli. When we were discussing skeletal muscle, remember the little guy running? And there was those pictures talking about, oh, the glucose is used up, and then the phosphagen system, then the anaerobic then back to aerobic, and then the oxygen debt repay. It's true that when you anticipate exercising, your heart rate goes up. Okay? So a person at a starting gate, knowing they're going to raise, actually, right, there's, there's, there's proprioceptive clues. So if you get into a, into a stance, if you will, where your muscles and your joints are beginning to tense up like you're about to sprint or do some sort of activity, then there's actually a proprioceptive signal that can also upregulate and inform your heart rate. So that means that your body actually has the ability of what? Anticipating the need for more blood flow. So you could think about or through this proprioception increase your heart rate and that would get your heart rate going up higher, wouldn't it? Which would make you probably able to sprint a little bit faster because you're going to have your oxygen already primed going to your muscles. What else is helping to control your blood pressure? Do, do, do we, know, we, we know this story, right? I mean, this isn't a complicated story. We're just adding some new angles to a story we already know. I hope you feel comfortable with this story. All right, we're adding some details, but I don't think it's overwhelming. So we've talked about baroreceptors in the past. Baroreceptors are stretch receptors, sensitive to stretch, pressure. And where are they found? Where do we find baroreceptors? If you were going to design the body and put in some alarm systems to inform the body that the blood pressure was too high or too low, where would you put those sensors? I'd want to put those sensors right near the heart in the aorta, right? Because the aorta is pumping, and if I'm not, if I got too much pressure or not enough pressure, that's a good place to measure my blood pressure. And I want to protect my brain pretty well, so I'm going to put one of those sensors on the way up to the brain in my carotid arteries, right? I don't want to blow out or not have enough blood pressure going to my brain. So the baroreceptors are receptors located both in the aorta, in the arch, and up in the carotid sinuses, up basically around where the common carotid splits into the internal and external, sort of up in that area. And those baroreceptors are directly wired to your cardiac center found in the medulla oblongata. So if your blood pressure is decreasing and your stretch receptors are not being activated enough, the baroreceptors in the aorta and going up to the brain, 
suggesting that perhaps you don't have enough pressure to feed the brain sufficiently, then your brain's going to get really, well, your brain's going to send a signal down to your, take it back, your baroreceptors are going to send a signal to your medulla oblongata, and what's that signal going to tell your heart to do? Increase, right? So it's going to tell your heart to increase or therefore be a positive chronotropic agent. If instead your blood pressure was too high, right? The pressure was too high, too much blood, too much pressure going up the carotid, too much pressure coming out of the aortic arch, then you would want to instead slow down your heart rate, be more parasympathetic. In addition to the baroreceptors, we also have another backup system called the chemoreceptors. Now, the chemoreceptors are in essentially the same place. There's also, however, an additional one in the medulla. So we've got the aortic arch, we've got the carotid, and in the medulla. And um, the medulla is, or, or, or these chemoreceptors are sensitive, it says, to pH, CO2, and oxygen. And while it's true that they do sense all of those molecules, the one that's actually triggering them is what? The chemoreceptors are actually sensitive to what? pH. Acid, right? To acid. Now, remember, we've had this conversation a few times, and I've alluded to it before. If your CO2 is rising, why would your CO2 levels be going up? If you're not circulating blood enough, right? And you're not getting rid of CO2, and CO2 is accumulating in your body, what happens to the blood pH? What happens? CO2 plus water does what? Makes... Remember this? CO2 plus water makes carbonic acid. What enzyme facilitated this? Carbonic anhydrase. What cells produce carbonic anhydrase? Red blood cells. When you listen to the little blood lecture, you're going to hear that blood cells, as they are maturing, red blood cells mature, they form tons of hemoglobin, for carrying oxygen, and the other thing that they make a lot of is carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme which catalyzes this CO2 plus water reaction. It, it, we're going to get into this whole, this whole story is going to continue to build as we go through the course. So these chemoreceptors are sensing pH changes, but what you're seeing here is what? If your CO2 levels are going up, what's happening to your pH? Going down, yes? CO2 levels are going up. You're making more acid. More acid drives the pH down. Would you also agree that your CO2 levels are inversely proportional to your O2 levels? Right? If you have high O2, you're going to have low CO2. If you have high CO2, you're going to have low O2. I hope I said that backwards, right? So... Increasing CO2 is also suggestive of low O2. So by measuring pH, these chemoreceptors are kind of keeping a watch on both CO2 and O2, but they're actually being triggered, if you will, by direct acid, okay, by pH changes. Now, if there's too much CO2, then we say that you are hyper, or you have hypercapnia. Hyper, higher. Capnia, this is the term used for carbon dioxide. Again, if you're hypercapnic, what happens? If you have hypercapnia, high CO2, then your pH is going to go down. If your pH is going down, we say that you are becoming acidotic or you, you have acidosis. What should the blood pH be? Blood pH should be 
If your blood pH starts going below 7.35, it's getting low. Doesn't sound like much, right? It's very finely tuned. If your blood pH starts dropping below 7.35, your body says, whoa, we're becoming too acidic. Those chemoreceptors are activated. Hmm. So if you're hypercapnic, what's your heart going to do? You got too much CO2. Your heart's going to want to do what? Help facilitate getting rid of it, which is going to do what to the heart? Increase the rate of the heart, and it's also going to increase your respiratory centers. Now, we'll get back into this when we get to the respiratory system, but just like you have a uh, a cardiac center in the brain stem that helps to regulate your heart rate, you also have a respiratory center in the brain stem that regulates how fast you're breathing. So if you're hypercapnic and you've got too much CO2, the lungs want to do what? Get rid of the CO2 by increasing the respir respiration rate, and the heart will also want to help out with that process and help get rid of the CO2 as well. Another way of thinking about it, I want to get rid of CO2 and I want to get more oxygen in, right? And both of those are going to require increased lung and increased heart. So we have these chemoreceptors and we have baroreceptors, both of which are, you know, doing this. So there's what I just said in words. If you're hypercapnic, have hypercapnia, and you agree, if you have high CO2, that you're becoming or have acidosis. So with high CO2, you have more acid, and that's going to stimulate the cardiac center, and raise your heart rate. Flip it around. What else would cause this? Hypercapnia. Um, let me make sure that's a C, right? CO2. Hypercapnia would be similar to what? If they're inverse related, high CO2 would suggest that you also have O2 levels that are low, right? If you have low O2 levels, what do we call that? hypoxemia, right? Hypo, ox, oxygen, emia, blood. So hypoxemia would be a low oxygen level of the blood, pretty much synonymous with hypercapnia, a high level of CO2 in the blood. Cool stuff, right? So both of these chemo and baroreceptors are doing good old negative feedback to help us keep our heart rate at a nice steady number. I'm going to pause here for a couple minutes and let you guys think about this and get some water as well. I think my heart rate has really slowed yes, down. Yes, yes. Well, let's, uh, let's not get too parasympathetic here, right? Let's, uh, <laughs> let's keep the heart flowing. And uh, let's just finish up this chapter, and then I'll entertain a few questions. I'll give you some, uh, again, some more ideas. And, uh, you know, because I have pre-recorded two lectures for you, I'm actually a little bit ahead. And there's a part of me that wants to say goodbye in about 20 minutes. And there's a part of me that says, I may want to keep on going. We'll just see how we're feeling, OK? Uh, the, the chapter 19 material would not be on the exam. Or, sorry, the chapter 20 material. So the 20 material would not be on the exam if I keep on going. I'll, I'll make my decision here in a moment. So what did we just say? Uh, that there are sympathetic and parasympathetic effects on the heart. And how does the sympathetic system work? What does it do? Tell me the story again. The sympathetic system stimulates the heart by increasing what? Norepinephrine is released. The norepinephrine is then going to work this little magic box to increase the number of calcium channels. Those calcium channels are going to open more quickly, causing the heart to reach threshold and depolarization more quickly. Also, the calcium will be sequestered more quickly back into the SR, so the heart can beat faster and relax and respond more quickly again. What sorts of molecules or what sort of situations would drive a sympathetic condition? So I just said what? What would drive the heart rate up? When it comes to the baroreceptors, what would cause the heart rate to go up? Blood pressure is low, right? It's not high enough, and so the body is going to respond by driving it up. 
or in the chemo receptor side, the heart rate would go up if there was high, high CO2, low oxygen, or low pH, right? So in a hypoxic or a hypercapnic situation, the body wants to get rid of that CO2 and increase its oxygen levels, and it would be sympathetic, right? It'd be a positive chronotropic effect. Flip it around. Parasympathetic. Works through acetylcholine. Acetylcholine goes via the vagus nerve, influences the SA node by doing what? Opening yeah. potassium channels. Those potassium channels now are going to cause the resting membrane potential to become more negative, making it less likely to reach threshold, making it more difficult, and the heart rate, therefore, slowing down. What would cause these responses? Too little CO2, too much oxygen, right? So turn around. And the blood pH would go up, right? So the chemoreceptor would work exactly, just turn everything around, do a cartwheel. Or baroreceptors. If the pressure was too, the heart's going to relax if the pressure is too high. Okay, so if the blood pressure is too high, the baroreceptors sense it, send the vagus nerve to the rescue uh, by influencing the medulla oblongata. What else can stimulate the heart in addition to all the things we talked about? Well, we know that uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine are, st are potent card cardiac stimulants. Uh, so um, nicotine. We know stimulates the heart. It's a catecholamine secretion. When you hear the word catecholamine, catecholamines are the what? We're back to that lovely endocrine chapter, right? Catecholamines are norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay, and dopamine. So catecholamines are increased by nicotine. Thyroid hormone also increases the adrenergic receptors. If someone is hyperthyroid, what do you hear about? Darn it. A little more hyper? Right, lower weight perhaps, a little more hyper. And if they're hypothyroid, a little more sluggish? A little weight gain, right? So thyroid hormone is that, that energy level and that uh, uh, response. A person who is hypothyroid, who is put on thyroxine, who's put on thyroid hormone medications, will typically talk about how much more energy they have, right? Again, because the thyroid hormone is increasing this whole heart stimulation pathway. Caffeine also is a stimulant, but how does it work? Caffeine inhibits cyclic AMP breakdown. Now, I didn't talk about cyclic AMP, but I remember I told you that the adrenergic effect was through a G protein secondary messenger system, and cyclic AMP is part of that. So if we break down, or if we inhibit the breakdown of cyclic AMP, we actually prolong the sympathetic effect. So caffeine works by a different mechanism, but still causes a stimulation of the heart. What else? How about electrolytes, right? Potassium, calcium, and we've been talking about them along the way. Um, let's start at the bottom. If you are hypercalcemic, hypercalcemia, too high a level of calcium in the blood. Hmm. That's actually going to decrease the heart rate and decrease the contraction strength. If you are hypocalcemic, not enough calcium, then you would have a deficiency and increase the heart rate. From when it comes to potassium, hyperkalemia. Now, look at those two words. They look very different, right? K Kalemia, potassium, calc, C-A, calcium. They don't sound very different, though, do they, when you say them quickly? So just be careful. Read them carefully. Hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia. And you can read there what those are going to do. So if you have hyperkalemia, it's going to make the muscle of the heart less excitable, slow the heart rate down. And if instead you are hypokalemic, you are going to cause the cells to become hyperpolarized. 
um, and require increased stimulation. Okay, so the last few slides are dealing now with a really cool phenomenon of the heart. We know that cardiac output, that, what's cardiac output again? What's the equation? Cardiac output is equal to stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped out each time, times the heart rate. And I, I told you that at rest, between four and six liters of blood per minute, cardiac output, and that it can absolutely increase, right, into the 20s and even 30s in an elite athlete. So we know that the heart can handle a lot more blood than what it does normally. Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, and we also said how cardiac output, while cardiac output stays essentially constant throughout life, the heart rate is creeping up as we age, and with that creeping up, the stroke volume is creeping down, and that inverse relationship keeps the cardiac output essentially constant. So let me describe to you three things that, that govern or control stroke volume. And these three terms are important ones. You'll hear a lot about them with, with anything to do with the cardiology. Preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload, contractility, and afterload. And I'm going to go through each one of these. And I'm going to tell you right now that increased preload or increased contractility will increase stroke volume, whereas increased afterload will decrease stroke volume. So just kind of star those comments, but in a moment, it's going to make a whole lot more sense as I describe what I'm talking about. Preload. What's it sound like? What I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting to, where I'm heading is that the heart will respond. Right? If you put more blood into the heart, if the circulation increases, the heart can handle it. So preload is the amount of tension put on the ventricular myocardium, on the heart muscle, immediately before it begins to contract. In other words, the more blood you put into the ventricle, the more the ventricle will be stretched, and that will increase the preload. But well, what do you think the heart's going to do? If you put more blood in the heart, is it going to accommodate that larger amount of blood? Absolutely. So what it's going to do is that if you increase the preload, it's actually going to increase the force of the contraction. It's actually going to respond by squeezing back harder. Right? So if you stretch the heart, it will squeeze back in response. So in, if you're exercising, more blood, right? You've got more blood moving through your circulatory system. You would have more blood coming in. So what would increase? What, what value, what number would increase? If you're exercising and there's more blood coming in per stroke, your end diastolic volume, right? The more blood would be coming in. And with that increased blood, it would stretch the myocardium, and the myocardium will, in response to that, generate even more tension. Now, what will it do? If we're creating more tension, then we're going to increase what? Stroke volume. And in doing so, increase the cardiac output. Now, this whole relationship was described by two guys. Uh, and they share this uh, law, if you will, of the heart, Frank and Starling, and I honestly forget their names, their first names, but this, these are the two last names. Okay, so Frank and Starling both described this relationship of the heart, and what they basically said is that the stroke volume, right, the amount of blood squirted out with every beat of the ventricle is proportional to, that's proportional to, that little squiggle, is proportional to the end diastolic volume. So the more blood in the heart, stretching the heart, the greater the stroke volume will be in response to that. In other words, the ventricles will eject as much blood as you can put into them, right? They'll always keep up with the demand. The more they're stretched, the harder the ventricles will contract. This is the Frank Starling law. Second thing that influences stroke volume 
is contractility. This has to do with how hard the heart is going to contract, okay? How hard the myocardium is going to contract is the contractility. Now, this, um, here we have other agents. A moment ago, I talked about chronotropic agents that did what? Influence the timing of the heart. Now I'm going to describe um, inotropic agents. They're going to describe or influence the contractility, the force of the heart. Okay. So things that have an increased contractility would be high calcium. If you have high calcium, you're going to have stronger, more prolonged contractions. Catecholamines. What did we say about catecholamines? Catecholamines include norepinephrine. What did we say? Norepinephrine did what? Opened up more calcium, right? Which caused more contraction. Uh, glucagon. What in the world is glucagon? Glucagon, not glycogen, but glucagon. Talk to me. Glucagon was a hormone that was yin-yang with insulin, right? Made by the pancreas specifically by the alpha cells of the pancreas. And glucagon stimulates cyclic AMP. And finally, digitalis. Have you heard of digitalis? Medication? Yeah. Uh, digitalis raises calcium levels and therefore also would lead to a stronger contraction. So those are all considered positive inotropic agents because they increase the strength of the contraction. What things would reduce contractility? Turn it around. Hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, and, as we know, the vagus nerve. Okay? Um, the vagus nerves can have an effect as well. I was going to say something here. It will come to me in a moment. Well, the vagus nerve, right? Parasympathetic. So not only when you, remember what I said when the heart, when the bear walks in, not only does your heart beat faster, it beats harder. That's contractility. So parasympathetic would do what? Cause the heart to beat slower and with less force. Yes? Kind of complete, complete reversal. So those were two of the terms, right? Preload and contractility. The third term that influences um, stroke volume is afterload. Now, if I don't go on and say anything else, what are you going to anticipate afterload is? Preload was what? The amount of blood pushing on the ventricle before contraction. So if you follow that logic, what would afterload be? The amount of force on the wall after. Unfortunately, we'd be wrong. I hate this term, okay? So afterload is not quite the opposite of preload, although it sounds like it should be. Afterload actually refers to the amount of uh, resistance, okay? The amount of resistance. Remember we talked about blood only moves through a tube because there's a pressure change, remember? With increasing pressure, blood or fluids will move through a tube. But what was working against that pressure? Resistance, right? So blood will or any fluid, will move through a tube from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, but there's always resistance pushing back on the movement of that fluid. So afterload actually refers to the amount of pressure in the aorta and in the pulmonary trunk. Where are those two vessels? The aorta and the pulmonary trunk are the vessels where? Just outside of the ventricular contraction. And so what we're dealing here is basically pressure back. This is an opposing force. Afterload decreases stroke volume, right? So if you have increased resistance, then that's going to make it more difficult to push the blood out. So afterload refers to the resistance or the, res uh, yeah, the resistance, right, of blood going out of the heart. Hypertension increases afterload. What's hypertension? What we're going to talk more about hypertension and blood pressure in the next chapter. We're going to, outside of this test, and we're going to talk about blood pressure and hypertension next week in lab as well. But what causes hypertension? Yes? 
stress, but I mean, from an anatomical standpoint, what's going on with hypertension? An increased pressure on the vessels because of a buildup, atherosclerosis, right? A buildup of stuff within the vessels. And what does that do? Think about it, right? If, if you're the heart, you're the heart, right? And, and you're a blood vessel and you're, or you're, sorry, you're a red blood cell, and you're about to be pushed up and out of the left ventricle up through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. But if the aorta and all of the vessels going to the rest of your body are filled with crap, then the lumen is smaller, right? And the pressure in those vessels goes up. You have hypertension. Well, is it easier or harder to push blood through that narrower tube? Harder. That's afterload. Right? So the heart is trying to squeeze, but there's resistance because the flow is not as good at points downstream. Now, what's the heart going to have to do in response to that? Work harder. And what does a muscle do that works harder? Gets bigger. Right? What does a heart do? What does any muscle do that you work out? It gets bigger. And we want all of our muscles to be big except for our heart. Right? We want a small, efficient, super strong heart. But if there's hypertension and there's more work for the heart to do its job, then the heart will have to naturally work out more and therefore get bigger. And a bigger heart is less efficient. They're making the heart work harder, but their vessels are clean, if you will, right? They, they're drinking turpentine. So their vessels are clean too, right? And so everything's good, and their heart's very efficient. And their heart rate, we know, is lower at rest, and their stroke volume is higher because it's more efficient. But a person's heart who gets bigger, you would think bigger is stronger. Mm -mm. In the heart, bigger is less efficient. So as it squeezes, it can't push as much blood out, right? You want a nice, tight squeeze of a heart. When that heart gets bigger, when it squeezes, right, it's not pushing as much blood out, is it? So the stroke volume's going down. If the stroke volume's going down, then the heart rate must go up. Uh-huh, we're aging, right? So as we age, there'll be a little bit of this going on, right? There's gonna be a little bit of this accumulation of crud in our vessels. So our afterload's going to increase. Therefore, our stroke volume will decrease. And to get the makeup for that, our heart rate has to go up to keep our cardiac output the same. Ty. So is it mostly the increase in the volume of the heart that makes it less efficient? Yeah, the increase in the volume. So think about it, right? One of the dead white guys, Boyle, right? Pressure and volume are inversely related. So if I'm squeezing on the heart, I'm not able to get the bigger volume, right? When I squeeze, the pressure won't be as great. So therefore, I'm going to reduce my stroke volume, and I've got this pushing back pressure as well from the buildup of junk. So with hypertension, is it also more muscle, but the bigger volume is also just... Yeah, so, so with hypertension, your heart gets enlarged. Now, at some point, remember, your heart is sitting in this sac called the pericardium. And the pericardium, we think of as being a serous membrane. It's just a thin layer, but there's also that fibrous pericardium. So your heart is actually in a rather big leather sac-like structure. And that, peric that um, pericardium won't get bigger. So your heart will get bigger. But at some point, the heart can't get any bigger. There, there's actually a limitation to its increase in size. And at some point, the heart gets so big that it really loses its efficiency. So the last thing you want to hear about is going to the doctor, oh, you have an enlarged heart. This is not good, right? An enlarged heart is not what you want to hear about. Why do you have that enlarged heart? Probably because you've had 30 years of hypertension. Right? It's having to work really, really hard. What do you think? Big story? Yeah. If we know the story, we can do cartwheels around it, right? If we know that, if we think about the overall story, we can, we can work our way through any kind of question that was asked about, okay, what happens if this happens and this goes up and that goes down? So does it make sense? Hypertension increases afterload. Rather than afterload, I mean, I like to just cross that word out and put resistance, right? Because that's really what it is. So hypertension increases with resistance and opposes, right? You're not spitting out as much each time. You're reducing the what? Stroke volume each time.
So anything that impedes the circulation of your blood through your arteries is going to increase your afterload. Anything that increases, right, that, or sorry, anything that impedes, slows down, interferes with the flow of blood is going to increase the afterload, increase the resistance. This can include lung diseases. If you have lung diseases and blood can't flow through the lung as well, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the right side of the heart? Lung disease, vessels of the lung are not as, they're not allowing blood to flow through the way they should. That means the right side of the heart will have to work more hard, and the right side of the heart would start to increase in size because it's being stressed out, not being able to get blood to the right side. And this is exactly what happens in chronic bronchitis, is what happens, you know, constant inflammation, constant uh, infection of the lungs, emphysema, right? So people with emphysema, right, they have emphysema, and then suddenly they're hearing about having CHF. They're having congestive heart failure because, again, their heart's having to work extra hard, and the fluid's building up, and they're drowning in their own body. That's my commercial not to smoke. Okay. Okay. So um, let's take a couple more slides here, right? So what happens is we exercise. Heart rate goes up. Heart works harder. I've already mentioned that there are proprioceptors that can influence your cardiac center. That is, as you anticipate moving, as your joints are in a, in a, in a position where the body, okay, it looks like this guy's going to start running or doing something, the heart rate actually can go up. And again, with increased muscular activity, there's also increased venous return. If you have more blood coming back into the heart, that does what? More blood coming back into the heart increases the EDF, sorry, EDV. EDV is going to, according to Frank and Starling, do what? Increase stroke volume, because the more blood that comes in, the heart will be stretched by it, preload, increase preload, greater contractility, and increase the amount of blood each time. But that stroke volume is being inhibited by what? Afterload, All right? So the stretching, the, the, the preload, and the strength are increased but they would be reduced, right? The stroke volume would be reduced by any kind of resistance or afterload. So there's that, another way of saying what's been said already. Exercise produces ventricular hypertrophy, hmm. which is why, right, an athlete can can tolerate more exertion than a person who's not as active, and why? Because they have an increased stroke volume. Now, ventricular hypertrophy there is not suggesting to you that the heart is getting larger, but the heart is definitely more strong. So that ventricular uh, hypertrophy, the heart is so strong that it's very, very efficient, right? It has a very good, very high stroke volume and that allows the resting heart rate of an athlete to be lower. What can go wrong with all this, right, in addition to emphysema, but also coronary artery disease, CAD, any kind of constriction of the coronary arteries, uh, usually as a result of atherosclerosis. Remember, athero means fat, sclero means hard. So the hardening of the arteries from a buildup of this cholesterol layers within the arteries and this can lead to a de uh, 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 degrading of the wall of the vessel and eventually the obstruction of the lumen. In lab next week, you'll be taking a look at arteries that are atherosclerotic, that have buildup of this plaque in the layers, and you'll see the restriction of the lumen. Clearly, if that lumen is really small, then the pressure in that vessel is very high, the afterload is very high, the heart is having to work really, really hard to overcome that afterload, and the heart over time enlarges. What other things can cause CAD in addition to atherosclerosis? Any kind of damage, long-term hypertension, right? Long-term hypertension can do this. Um, diabetes is definitely known to change vascular, uh, have vascular implications. So people with type 2 diabetes are at increased risk for heart disease, uh, large vessel type problems, 
a heart attack and stroke. People with type 1 diabetes are at higher risk for microvascular things. Uh, that is the, the kidney problems, some of the uh, blindness and um, circulation issues as well. That's, of course, with, with uncontrolled blood sugar. Uh, what's going on? So I, I mentioned to you that um, uh, atherosclerosis is happening, but what's really happening is that monocytes, right, can you picture a monocyte? All right, monocytes penetrate the walls of damaged vessels. And there, um, they start actually leading to this atherosclerotic plaque. And again, we'll talk more about that next week. The problem is platelets typically don't bind, right? When you, when you listen to my little presentation on the blood, you'll hear me say that platelets typically put out a, a compound called prostacyclins, or the endothelial cells do, of the blood vessels. And that molecule prevents platelets from sticking. You don't want platelets sticking to your blood vessels, right? Unless there's damage. So you want platelets floating through your blood all the time in case of damage. But you never want your platelets to start to cause a plug or a blockage when things are well. Well, atherosclerosis starts to damage the inside of the vessel wall. That signal that things are damaged can start to activate platelets and platelets think, oh, there's something wrong here, and I'm going to clog, clog up the blood flow. So damage to the vessels in, exasperates and leads to this uh, situation where platelets can start to adhere, and that can definitely increase the rate of clots right, and blockages to the vessels. And that atherosclerosis gets bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker and eventually starts to clog out the lumen. Now, what can happen? When those coronary arteries, we've, we've mentioned this, when the coronary arteries start to close down and there's a restriction in blood flow, at rest, no problem. But what happens when a person with restriction in their arteries, in their coronary arteries, begins to exercise? Right? And if there's a significant blockage, although it's not a complete blockage, it's a significant blockage, and during those times of exercise and stress, they start feeling chest pain. Right? Not a full heart attack, but this angina. Again, that can be uh, after years of having these atherosclerotic changes. What are the risk factors for atherosclerosis? This is changing a little bit. Um, your doctor may have some slightly different uh, recommendations right now. But if you go to the doctor, they do a CBC, they do a complete blood count, and they come back with your triglycerides and your LDLs and your HDL. The rule of thumb is what? You want your highs to be highs and your lows to be low. So you want low, you want your LDLs to be low in number, you want your high, you want your HDLs to be high in number, and you want your overall triglycerides to be in control. Triglycerides basically is fat floating in your blood. So high triglycerides is leading to a buildup of this stuff. And it turns out that the LDLs, you want LDLs to be low. If you have high LDLs, it's a higher risk for atherosclerosis and um, those HDL molecules are actually protective. So you want HDL, you want lots of HDL, you want as low of LDL as you can, and we don't have to worry about the actual numbers, but that's sort of the rule of thumb. The other things that uh, you can't control, right, who your mommy and daddy are and the genetics that you've inherited, there is definitely uh, a genetic com you know, factor involved with coronary artery disease. Uh, getting older, just the way it is, right, there's an increase with each year you get older, and unfortunately being male also is another risk factor. So those things. Now the things that we can work on would be exercise, uh, not smoking. Uh, don't be too anxious, right? Stress doesn't do good things for our cardiovascular system. So chill, right? Just chill a little bit. And um, re you know, reduce that stress and aggression. Exercise and you know, get a punching bag. Put my face on it and you'll feel better. <laughs> So work on all those things. Right now, if we do find out we've got some buildup in our arteries, what can we do? We live in a time now where we've got some medical, you know, look at Dick Cheney, right? He's had more heart procedures done, and he's still ticking. So what can we do? Uh, there's coronary bypass surgeries that can go around blockages. There are the ability to go in and, and open up blockages, uh, balloon angioplasty, and you can also go in and kind of laser zap it out of there and work out those buildup molecules. I'm just going to say chapter, nine, chapter 20, right? And I'll feel better, but I'm not going to go into it, okay? So I'm just going to feel better by saying that I touched, that I just touched 
on to yeah. chapter 20, or ch uh, chapter, um, I think I'm saying the wrong chapter, chapter, tw chapter 19, right? So chapter 19, so there it is, and where are we heading with this? Chapter 19, not on this test, but we're going to be talking about blood vessels, um, blood pressure, and then after we go through the blood pressure, we'll be getting into the digestive system, and then I think we get into the respiratory system. So the next exam, respiratory, uh, arteries and veins, blood pressure, and a little bit of uh, GI. And that will leave us just one test at the end, I know you're already looking forward to it, uh, on reproductive, uh, overall metabolism, and the urinary system, which will be a big part of the final exam. So questions for me right now as you're leaving related to the exam. Anything at all? Got a couple minutes? Anything at all you're concerned about? Four o'clock, blue and gold, Tuesday. If you are in hybrid and you're listening, there's a hybrid uh, survey online to let me know when you're taking the exam. Other than that, have a wonderful weekend.